Listening to the flip side with Noah Philippiak, connecting the reality of the gospel to the grid of life. You can support the podcast and pick up some sweet flip side swag at www.patreon.com slash Noah Philippiak. What is up, Flip Upon Am I? Welcome to episode 86 of the Flip Side Podcast. We've been busy on the flip side putting out some great interviews recently. If you've missed any of them, I encourage you to uh, go back and check them out. Most recently was episode 85 with Dr. Terrence Lester, where we looked at how confronting buried history can build racial solidarity. Uh, The interview before that, I got to interview doctors Glenn Bracey and Michael Emerson on the religion of whiteness and some really fascinating research that they have done uh, with Christians. Episode 83 was an interview with Alan Noble on suffering, depression, and getting out of bed. Also, be sure to check out the feed. If you're not familiar with the podcast, go through the podcast feed and you'll find five-minute flips. You'll find Noah's rants, as well as our long-form episodes. You can also check out all the episodes, uh, the long-form and the Noah's rants, on YouTube at youtube.com slash Noah Philippiak. Big shout out. Thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you want to support the flip side and help make it sustainable, uh, that goes a really, really long way. I work part time at my church plant, planted a church called Mosaic Church in urban Grand Rapids. I'm part time there so that I can do this and uh, some other uh, writing ministries and beyond the battle ministries. And so your support on Patreon uh, is needed. It is it is not just a bonus. Uh, it is needed. So patreon.com slash Noah Philippiak is a great way you can support the podcast. Get yourself some sweet flip side swag like my flip upon my mug. Uh, which I'm drinking Chris's Blend today from Five Lakes. Uh, Shout out to Five Lakes and Angry Brew for supporting the podcast. Uh, Chris's Blend is a medium roast, and every bag you buy, a dollar goes to an orphanage in Honduras, which is awesome. Christian-owned company uh, that I am very thankful for their support of the flip side. When you buy a bag uh, off of fivelakes.com, use promo code FLIP, and you will get 10% off your order. Uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, just trying to help grow the podcast. Again, keep it sustainable, uh, getting some more listeners. One thing you can do that is free and very much appreciated. I know I don't, I don't think about it. If I'm asked to do it, then I'm like, oh, I'll do that. Uh, share your favorite episode on your social media and a few lines about why you like the episode, why you like the podcast, and why your friends or followers should listen. Uh, that will go a really, really long way as well. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our interview today. I'm going to be interviewing Cameron Horner on disability in the church. Uh, And let me read his bio to you. But before I do, we're going to get into some topics that I always like to kind of recap where we've already talked about these on the podcast. So if you want to go back and uh, if you like the content today and want to hear more, I, I interviewed Ron Sanderson in episode 73 of The Flip Side. Ron has autism. And he also has a ministry of helping churches understand uh, disability in the church. And then Chase and I have done two episodes on the topics of healing and sign gifts, which Cameron and I get into. uh, And that was episodes 72 and 82, which you can check out. So let me read you Cameron's bio and tell you where to find him. And then uh, we'll jump into the interview. At 18 years old, Cameron experienced a diving accident in which he broke his neck and was left permanently paralyzed. Now from a wheelchair, he shares his story of God's faithfulness to him through his disability. Cameron has shared in a variety of spaces, including radio ministry, speaking tours in Ireland and India, along with numerous engagements in the U.S. Cameron's heart is for believers and non-believers alike to think accurately about suffering and disabilities and what great benefits these things bring to the church. Cameron is an alumni from Southeastern University, where he earned a degree in uh, biblical studies. When he's not speaking, Cameron enjoys wheelchair rugby, adaptive CrossFit, and many other activities that keep him active and engaged with his community. You can uh, connect with Cameron at CameronHornerMinistries.org, Instagram uh, at Cameron Horner Ministries, and on Facebook, look for Cameron Horner Ministries. And I got to admit, Cameron, I've never heard of threads. I think that means I must be old. 
when there's social media out there that you've never heard of, it just means you're old. I'm officially old. Uh, I am 40, which we talk about in our interview. Uh, so he's on threads, whatever that is, at Cameron Horner Ministries. All right. Really excited for this interview today. So buckle up. And here we go. All right, Cameron, welcome to the flip side. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, bro. What's up? I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Well, hey, I uh, I gave your intro already before you came on. I read your bio and all that good stuff. Um, you, you and I connected back in March at the Exiles in Babylon uh, conference. What was that like uh, for you, uh, speaking there? That was a that was a uh, and and um, I I follow Preston. I follow his podcast, and um, he's been gracious enough to endorse my book Beyond the Battle. So we've had some interaction and everything. Oh, but nice. um, I am uh, actually I was interviewed on his podcast a couple years ago too, and I've had him on here a couple times. I'm curious how your connection with him started and just what that was like uh, speaking at Exiles in Babylon and. Yeah, I'm just, uh, it was great. You did a great job and it was awesome to to meet you out there. Thank you, man. So I have listened to that podcast since I, I tried to figure it out exactly, but it was 2016. Nice. So I'm like, oh, gee, that was back when he did the, the <laughs> Q&As. And yep. um, so I've been listening to it forever. Um, then when he was like, hey, we're going to do a conference. I was like, well, I have to be there. Yeah. So I went to the conference the first time and uh, yeah, when he did it, what would it be 2021 was the first one um, or no, 2022 was the first one, I guess. And uh, so I was there and basically the way it started, I, you know, I was just a guy in the crowd. Uh, the way it started was I had to uh, email Chris, his wife, uh, for questions about accessibility. Your audience can't see this yet. Well, I guess you read the bio, but, uh, you know, I'm in a wheelchair. So I have accessibility issues that I had to email her about. And then when I got to the conference, you know, I met her and ended up sharing some of my story with her. And the next year they were excited about the topic of disability in the church. And I get a random email from them saying, Hey, would you, nice. <laughs> would you like to share your testimony at the exiles conference? Um, I was like, totally. So for me, it, it was such a privilege because I had been receiving from Preston for years. You know, I, I grew up in like backwoods kind of fundamentalist Baptist church, which I'm super thankful for my church growing up. Um, but there was just so many things that I didn't know how to think through uh, all that stuff. You know, we probably could have a lot of people could share that story. And um, I was young when I first started listening to the podcast and so it was really formative for me to learn how to think through topics and have nuance. So, yeah, when I had the opportunity to pour back into the conference, it was such a privilege to do that. And, um, yeah, share, share my story there of disability in the church, which has been beautiful and painful. You know, there's been yeah. two sides of, of my journey with disability in the church and um, got to share both of those. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, the topic itself is not one that I've interacted with a lot. I, I did have, uh, I'll have to I always do this where I think of an old episode of mine, and I, I don't have it all in front of me. So then I have to go like, look it up real quick. I did do an interview um, with uh, a guy named Ron Sanderson on uh, some, he, he has autism, and we talked about um, okay. disability in the church. Um, and he's, he's from episode 73. So if listeners want to go back and listen to that, um, and he came and spoke at my church as well, cause he's from Michigan here. And so that really was the beginning for me of sort of opening up my eyes, you know, to this topic. And, uh, and then when I heard the, the whole section of it on at exiles in Babylon, uh, that was really, that was really helpful to me too. Let me give a shout out, uh, to Preston's podcast, theology in the raw is the podcast we're talking about. I normally, yeah. so this is my, uh, I'm a flip eponymous mug. Uh, no, <laughs> normally I have my a mug that says my third favorite podcast is the flip side. And that's like our slogan. We try to be everybody's third favorite podcast. Uh, Cause you know, you don't want to shoot too high um, on effort and quality. Well, one day you'll be second. No, we're good with third. <laughs> Cause if you try to be second, you have to try too hard and make things better. You know, it's just easier to be sort of third is nice. 
you're on the podium, but you know, you didn't have to work as hard as first or second. So Preston's podcast would be a great first or second slot, you know, for totally. listeners if if anyone's uh, lo- looking. So totally, um, maybe he'll maybe he'll even listen to this and <laughs> he'll, you'll get I, an endorsement. <laughs> I'm I, I'm uh yeah, we're happy with the bronze around here, but I uh, always like to recommend other podcasts for for that gold or silver medal uh, on people's podcast podium. Uh, but let's jump into the topic disability in the church. You know, and let me let me just say I know at the at the conference, um, there was a there's some conversation around what terms to be used, and I do like to ask that because for some like myself and others, um, it's it's there's some similarities to conversations about race, which we talk about a lot on the flip side, yeah, and there really and, is. And the 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 terms evolve, they change. Uh, some terms kind of fall out of favor, and uh, so I while while I I. I it might get old for you. Um, can you kind of help us navigate the landscape of maybe terms not to use or terms to use and just what terms like you prefer? Cause I know, I think uh, from what I, from what I learned at the conference, just different people prefer different terms when it comes to disability and et cetera. Yeah, that's great. So first of all, you said terms are always evolving. So that's important to say at the front, at the outset, that even now terms that I may use or someone else may use, who knows, you know, in a year, because we're always trying to think through, okay, what's the most humanizing terms? What's the most humanizing way to say things? And and also, you know, for better or for worse, language is a touchy topic right now, you know, in our culture. So yeah. um, it is always evolving. And some of that's good. Some of that, you know, we need to think critically about. But um, so uh, the first thing to kind of think through the the term disabled is really the the preferred term and for a while it was kind of like well do we do we say disability is that is that okay to use and some people were like well differently abled is a better term or something like that and that's that's still okay and i don't mind that but um really people came back around the term disabled because what what we try to think about ourselves is that why do we need to avoid the reality? Mm-hmm. Like why why is my body and the reality that I have a disability such an issue that I can't even name it? You know, that that's a problem because we see ourselves as as um, a part of the diverse landscape of humanity. You know, I I bring a different type of body to the diverse landscape of humanity why do i need to avoid that and so using the phrase di- disabled or disability has been readopted and is kind of the the standard term at this point beyond that though what people are asking is do i use person first language or disability first language so what that would mean is are you a disabled person or a person with a disability and um, I, I know that sounds, you know, to like we're splitting hairs, but what that represents is if I'm using person first language, then I'm seeing my identity as first a person and then the disability second. But some people would actually even have a problem with that and say, well, no, my disability is such an intrinsic part of who I am. And it's not something I'm trying to shy away from that. I, I I would identify as a disabled person. So what what we're getting at here is that there is some range of the way that people use terms. Um, so get to know the person, you know, yeah. ask the person, what, yeah. what, what do you prefer? And don't make that your first conversation, of course. But as you get to know someone, what do you prefer? What what is what is the term you, you like? Um, but but broadly speaking, disabled um, is is a great is a great term. We love it. Um, but it's funny because certain terms like crippled or crip have been um, have been like uh, rehabilitated, I would say, or uh, or redeemed. Um, it's not something that an able-bodied person tends to use. But in the disabled space, you know, we'll use crip or we'll use uh, terms like that that could seem like almost pejorative. And, and we use them because they were pejorative, you know, but 
now we've redeemed them. Um, so like, um, we could get into this later, but the, the world, all of life is more expensive for disabled people. Mm. And, um, there's a term for that and it's, uh, the crypt tax. The crypt mm. tax is basically a term for saying like the fact that we basically have to pay more to even exist. But that's just one example of the way the word crypt has been redeemed uh, to, to uh, yeah, almost be a useful term for us now. But um, when you get into intellectual disabilities, um, I, I am, I, you know, I'm, I have a physical disability, so I'm a little bit less familiar on how all of that, all those terms are evolving. Um, but intellectual disability or um, developmental disability are some terms that are used. Um, again, you know, I, I'm I'm not as up to speed on on those, but that that you know, when I'm at conferences on disabilities, those are the terms being used. So. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, kind of navigate yeah. the the landscape a bit, and uh, and yeah. So next, um, could you jump into you know sort of the short er version of your story i know you share it a lot and so i'm thankful for you to be you know come on and share it with our listeners that aren't familiar with it uh but i'd love to just kind of kind of set the table with your story so listeners have an idea of of where you're coming from and then we can uh it's we can just kind of jump into some questions uh based on that yeah for sure so right now while we're talking i don't I hate to share this, but I am 30 years old now. Hey, so I, I have happy birthday. <laughs> turned the page. Yeah. When was your birthday? Oh, well, it was back in May, but. Okay. Um, All right. So but, I turned 40 this year, so I'm 10 years ahead of you. Think, okay. if, you think, if you think turning 30 makes you like, oh man, I, I just turned 40. So yeah. Bro, you look great for 40. That's great. <laughs> so uh, the reason I say that is uh, when I was 18, yep. I had a, uh, a an accident that uh, left me paralyzed from the chest down. So I was, uh, first of all, I, I like to share this part. I had this massive, unexplainable spiritual awakening when I was 17. Um, it, would be, it would be really hard to exaggerate uh, what the Lord did for me in those years. Um, just saw, saw miracles, saw incredible things, uh, and he really brought my heart to life. Um, but... Uh, when I, so when I turned 18, I really felt a call to ministry, felt a call to get out there and share my testimony, share, share what the Lord was doing with me. Um, I was decent at public speaking, kind of felt a call to some kind of, you know, speaking or whatever that looked like, um, but didn't want to go to school. Uh, however, I did feel like the Lord was calling me to that. And so found a Bible college actually in Minnesota that I was going to be going to. And my car was packed, was, was packed for college. Uh, but a few days before going off to school, I, uh, me and my family decided to go on family vacation one more time to the lake that we went to for years. I mean, literally since, I mean, since my dad was a kid, my family was going to this lake. So it was, you know, ingrained into who we were as a family. Uh, so I was super comfortable with this lake, um, had been swimming in these waters for years. Um, so when we got to the lake day one of the of the vacation i was doing sh shallow water dives so the water was like four and a half or five feet deep and it fluctuated year to year uh which is could be a problem um but i was doing shallow water dives it's basically, basically you hit the water you skim the surface um it's not super safe you know but if you know how to do it Day two of this trip, uh, I was swimming with a friend and we, uh, we decided to run as fast as we could down the end of the dock. And I, I really took off. I, I started sprinting down this dock, which is like uh, maybe 25 yards long. So it was a, a longer dock. And when I got to the end, um, I was running really full speed and I jumped off the end of the dock, I spread my arms. It was going to be a good one. Uh, but I was going so fast this time that when I hit the water, I went straight to the bottom. I mean, just pencil, pencil dive straight to the bottom. And I hit the bottom of the shore and all of the weight of my 18 year old body uh, was put directly on my neck and my shoulders went up, my head went down and my spine shattered. 
and the bones of my spine went into my spinal cord and I received uh, what's called a spinal cord injury. Um, and if you don't know, uh, if your audience doesn't know much about uh, the spinal cord injury world, so the spinal cord is the nerves that run from your brain to the rest of your body. So um, any signal that goes anywhere uh, to your body, it goes down your brain stem and into your spinal cord. And if any part of your spinal cord is damaged, then the signals from your brain can't get to the rest of your body um, below that point. So, you know, the, the spinal cord runs the length of your back. Um, so there, there's different points that you could have your break. Um, my break uh, and my spinal cord injury, uh, it was at a place that left me completely paralyzed. Um, in the moment. Now, since that time, I, I've regained movement in parts of my arms. Um, but in the moment, I became immediately completely paralyzed. Um, and I didn't float up. I was under the water. I was holding my breath and was stuck. Couldn't help myself. Couldn't, um, couldn't swim up. Didn't really even know where up was, honestly. Um, but, you know, going back to the spiritual awakening thing uh, in that moment, the best way that I can describe it is that the spirit of the Lord just came over me and led me to prayer um, because that was the, the thought that came, like, call out to God here. And so I turned to prayer uh, under the water. And, you know, there's <laughs> in a situation like that where you're completely helpless and you've never been completely helpless before. Um, a lot of emotions can come over you. Um, and I remember distinctly this feeling of like, okay, I, I, I could very well be about to die here. That was, that was the first time I think I had ever experienced that before. Like, okay, you, you're, you might be about to die. Um, but when I went to prayer, this peace came over me. Like it was almost physical. Like I just felt this tangible peace come over me and I interpret it as Cameron you're going to be okay um but I was under the water for uh a little over a minute um and I really wasn't one that could hold my breath for that long uh, I wasn't a swimmer or, or anything outside of just family vacations um there's a thing that happens when you hold your breath for so long where your body reflexively makes you try to gasp and it's funny <laughs> First of all, for your audience, I didn't, you know, I didn't pass out. I didn't blank, black out at any point during this. Um, I, under that water, I knew that fact. <laughs> so funny, the things that we think about. I knew yeah. that fact of, okay, I'm going to like reflexively breathe in at some point. And it got closer and it got closer and it got closer. And then, no, it actually happened. I had this reflexive gasp in. And I don't know how to explain it. And I try not to make more of it than it is. But I really believe that I experienced some kind of sustaining miracle from God because I just had I just had more air. It was like I didn't take in water. I just took in a little bit more air. And I don't know if it's like something in my throat. I, I don't know how it happened, bro. But I remember a week later when I was finally able to talk, um, which I can get into. Mm all of that. But a week later, I was like, had to tell people about what happened under that water to give me just a, just like a few more seconds, 10, 15 more seconds. Um, it, I mean, it was a profound moment for me uh, that I'll always remember. Um, but even after that, even after like that little miracle, um, I was still under the water, still waiting, still praying. And then suddenly my friend appeared right beside me um that I was swimming with and this friend was a former lifeguard so she pulled me up supported my head and began pulling me back to shore and um you know I I, I know I'm going long on this but this is is such a cool part of the story the day before this diving accident happened me and that friend were swimming and a uh another uh my niece actually was with us and she asked my friend hey how do you save someone when they're drowning so to, to demonstrate, I pretended to drown. She pretended to save me in the exact same position that I was in the next day after this diving accident. So that like 
jogged her memory of, oh, this is how you save someone who's paralyzed in the water. Um, so, yeah, crazy, profound thing that occurred there. Um, but fast forward back after the injury, she's pulling me to the shore and I just start calling out to the Lord. I think, again, just the spirit of God came over me because, you know, I, I wasn't holy enough that I would always think to do those things. Um, but this, and this might help lead the conversation along a little bit. Some of the, um, so I began calling out to the Lord, but I also began saying healing scriptures that I had memorized in the year prior. Um, so the spiritual awakening to go back to that, that happened before my injury it was in the context of the faith healing and word of faith movement or prosperity gospel. Um, so I was, I was of the persuasion that anyone that is broken or sick um, or disabled, it is always God's will for them to be healed. Um, now in that moment, you know, of the intensity of this accident, I, I wasn't thinking through theology, you know, I was calling out to God with the faith that I had, as an 18 year old, you know, and God honored that and he came close and he stayed close to us. Um, and he's been so good to me and my family through all of these things. Um, but because of the, the way that I had kind of come awake to the spirit, um, the first thing that came to mind, you know, as I realized that I'm broken is to start saying these healing scriptures you know, by, by his stripes, I'm healed in Jesus name, I'm healed. And, um, that was still, I think, right and good for where I was at the moment. Um, because that was the, that was what I had. That was the faith that I had. Um, but, but certainly the, the hope of healing was the first thing I, I latched on to was like, God, I need you to heal me right now. And, um, so we, we can table that and come back to yeah. it, but, um, just long story short from here, you know, I, my family came around, we called out to the Lord, we began praying and, um, the, uh, paramedics came, took me to the hospital and I was actually in the ice. So 18 hours of surgery later. Uh, yeah. I, uh, they put me back together, was in the ICU there for eight or 10 days, um, had tubes down my throat, couldn't talk, all the things. Um, but bro, the spirit of God was so thick in that hospital room. I mean, crazy stories of miracles and the spirit of God working in our lives from day one. Um, really, that would be a whole nother podcast. <laughs> um, but finally got stable enough and they, uh, med medically flew me to Atlanta, Georgia, where I began four months of therapy, uh, learning to live life again from a wheelchair. It was, uh, a difficult and, uh, at times utterly painful. Um, and at times as strange as it sounds beautiful and all the things, uh, the process of, uh, learning to live life again in that state, but. You literally learn, you, you start day one of therapy, which again, I was, I was in a hospital bed for another month once I got there. But when I was finally able to begin therapy, it was day one, roll over on your side. That's, that's the first thing you learn to do. Uh, and as things progress, you know, you learn to dress yourself again, you know, without being able to move your legs and mm basic life tasks and by the time you leave there you know hopefully you can begin to navigate the world as a disabled person um but it was quite a process so yeah 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 that was that was my story yeah man well thank you thank you for sharing that with us and i i'm really intrigued by so you know you shared um uh, much of that back in march at the conference and and for me um I, I want to dive in a little bit to the healing, you know, the healing conversation and some of the theology and, sure. and not, not, I know you're not, you know, you've told me you're like, I'm not a theologian, but like, you've really had to live it, right? You've really had to live it out um, when it comes to your life and your personal really experience and relationship with God. And uh, for me, I, and I appreciated what you shared about your, your background too, um, you know, and, 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 uh, I, I think that matters like, so for, so for me, my background, when it comes to 
healing the theology and things like that. And uh, for listeners that want to hear more about this, uh, my buddy Chase and I, who's another pastor, we talked through kind of the sign gifts and and healing on episode 72 and 82 of the flip side, where um, my background growing up was conservative Baptist. My church was cessationalist, which is a fancy word for ceasing that these sign gifts have ceased. And we get, we talked through some of that on there. And it was when I, when I was in college, I started to really read the Bible for myself and I'm reading scripture. That's like about healing and the gifts of healing. And it's, it's very much not had not ceased. And there really, in, in my opinion, I guess, uh, these things hadn't ceased and there's not not good biblical evidence that they had ceased. Uh, but but it, it it left me, and, and to this day, even as a pastor, it's left me in this sort of limbo state in between sort of where um, I've, I've tried some of those, you know, healing prayers for people and they haven't worked, so to speak, like the person yeah. hasn't, hasn't been healed. There was a, one, one of your stories. Uh, and I, and I want to ask you this next, how this, how this has been for you, but uh, one of your stories, stories that you told reminded me of a story that I shared on one of those episodes. I was, I was in a, a hospital room with a guy. Um, it, it, it may have been a, like a, like a rehab facility uh, at that time, but a, a younger guy in our church who had really, his back was really, really messed up. Um, he's actually was a refugee and I'm trying to remember the context of his, his back injury. But at the time, um, he could not, uh, he could not walk he, and uh, at least just shuffling steps, like really, really. So then I had an older guy with me who was a former pastor and uh, pretty charismatic in his background. And we prayed for the guy that couldn't walk. And then the guy next to me, the older guy says, now get up and walk. Like it's bib- like, like we're in the new Testament, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, Whoa, we, I, I'm going like, this is going to be great if this happens. Right. Yeah. And, and like the dude couldn't walk, you know, and it was really awkward. It was like, Oh my gosh, we should not be doing this. Like he's not even supposed to be doing this right now. Like if a doctor was, new, they would, they would tell us to stop and he couldn't walk. And it was awkward too, because the older guy was going like, yeah, you're walking, praise God. And I'm like, he's not walking. Like he's like, we're holding him up and he's sort of shuffling and this looks bad. And anyway, so I know you share some stories like that for you. And I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, let me narrow my question down here. We'll get to a couple different questions. Um, start with, I, I, I love your perspective as someone who believes in the sign gifts, someone who's experienced miraculous answer to prayer from God. You're underwater, Cameron, and you yeah. don't have any air and you're praying to God and he gives you air underwater. I mean, this is like, praise God, miracles happen. Yeah. 12 years in though, you're, you're still in a wheelchair, you know, and, and you, you, right. you've had to live out this uh, reality that miracles happen they don't always happen, at least the physical miracle that we are asking for. And yeah. I think that's really hard for a lot of Christians to get their heads around because we've all prayed for stuff that hasn't happened. And so it's easy to become jaded. It's easy to go, God doesn't love me. It's easy to go, I'm not a good enough Christian. I don't have enough faith. So uh, I don't know if we want to start there or start with uh, some of your experiences like that, where people have prayed over you to get up from your wheelchair and walk and what that's been like, maybe let's start there just on the narrative side of it. Uh, and then we'll kind of transition into some of the, some of the theological side of it. Yeah. So first of all, the story uh, that you shared is, is all too common and there is, and honestly, I, part of me is like, man, I, I want to have strong faith where like, yes, let's, yeah. let's do things that seem outrageous. Um, but as one who's been on the receiving end of that all many times, it is one of the most awkward and uncomfortable situations to be put in, to have someone, not, not to have someone pray of you that, that we can get to that, but to have someone pray over you and then now try and move your leg. Can I move your leg for you? Here, let's try and get you to stand up. And for years, I would let that happen. 
And it was, it, it was always so awkward. It was always so uncomfortable. And I finally one day, and there was a theological journey up to this point that I can get to, but I finally one day just had to make the decision. And it was actually a hard decision to make, believe it or not. Uh, I'm no longer going to let someone try and move my leg for me after they pray, or I'm no longer going to try and stand up for someone. And that felt like, at one point, that would have felt like I lost faith or I wasn't exercising my faith. But I, I finally just had to rest in where I was with the Lord with that. But um, so uh, what was your question again? Yeah, just the, my fr first question would be on that, like that feeling, that experience when someone's yeah. when someone's asking yeah. you that. And it's, and it's really difficult. Just did, to say. did you say in your talk back in at Exiles that you I mean, you, you've you were attending churches initially that were uh, I whether it be charismatic or um Pentecostal churches where this yeah, was sure. pretty common, like you'd, you'd wheel in and, and you were like, yeah, everybody was zoomed in, honed in on you, you know, almost like, like we've got one swarm around him. We're going to get this guy healed, you know? Yeah. And did you end up switching churches because you, that was, was that, and we'll get into the theological side of it too, but um, you don't still attend churches like that. And did that experience have something to do with it? Well, so to just to say, so the, kind of spiritual awakening in the charismatic space that I was in, that wasn't so much from a particular church that I was attending. It was more like preachers and pastors I was listening to, the Kenneth Copelands, the Kenneth Hagans, and I would be I would go to conferences and stuff where that, okay. that would be the case. Um, but the home church I was at was, it was kind of like this undercurrent of the charismatic Holy Spirit filled people that would would certainly do things like that. However, certainly I have been to churches for maybe a one-off service or something where you would go in and, um, and, and again, this would be after my injury, but you would go in and you would almost feel like, yeah, people saw you as you're a target, you know, you're an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to be healed. And I, I want to, but I want to be generous because so much of this is coming out of a heart that wants to see right. good happen for the person. You know, you, you truly believe when you're in this space, you truly believe like God really wants to heal this person. And it really is on me as, uh, as the person going to pray for them to exercise my faith and step out because, because in, in this mindset, faith means stepping out and doing something radical or uncomfortable that demonstrates or exercises your faith and shows, no, I really believe this so much that I would, I would jump off the cliff, you know, so to mm -hmm. speak, or, mm -hmm. or I would have the person, you know, jump out of their wheelchair and, and exercise his faith. Um, you know, just to say, as an example, there were many times after my injury, before I, I really came to a different conclusion that, uh, or several times, I won't say many times, but several times where I would end up on the floor because I was trying to exercise my faith. Yeah. Because that, that, that's what I believe. Like I need to do this to, to exercise my faith, to, to try and stand up out of this wheelchair. Um, so to, to go back to your previous question, though, there were, there were many times that, that I was at churches where everybody wanted to pray for me or, or several people throughout the, throughout the time, you know, you couldn't really, experience a service uh as as most people would because people were coming over to pray for you or there would be certain conferences even even today you know if i go to a certain conference or you know i went to a i went to a pentecostal school for my undergrad and so when i would when i would go to the um like the student conferences that they would have once a year i i know like there's going to be a certain number of people that are going to come over to pray for me and those are like you know, er, kids in their early 20s that are zealous for God. And I'm like, yes, pray for me. Let's go exercise your faith. But I'm going to turn around afterwards and say, hey, now can I pray for you? Mm. You know, and I'm going to pray for like their spiritual development or for wh whatever it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, man. So it, it's been an experience, um, certainly in the church where that's happened. I try not to be, I try not to be jaded about it i try not to yep. be too hard on, on my fellow believers about it because they really are trying to exercise their faith the way that they know to um and and i i haven't given up on 
believing in healing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, so if somebody wants to pray for me, I pretty much know what the Lord has spoken to me about my position as a person in a wheelchair. Um, but maybe the Lord wants to, you know, make my shoulders not hurt as much from pushing around all day. That's great. You know, maybe he yeah. has something he wants to impart through that prayer. So I'm never going to be one that turns down prayer um, even today. Um, but I just have a, I have a perspective on it that's different than I used to have. Yeah. Oh, that's really helpful. And that's why I want to talk to you about this specifically, because I think in the theological world or just the way for as Christians, we go on this, this pendulum, you have, you have the people over here that are, that are, that are jaded, I think, and that are, the, you know, yeah. and that maybe the cessationalist camp or, or they just say, all that is fake. All that is a show, you know, and they can they can look at the I don't know. I don't know a lot about Benny Hinn and all this stuff, but it just looks to someone who's not in that world. It looks silly and it, it looks like it's a like mm -hmm. it's um, uh, choreographed even, you know, and then you have yeah, people on, show. on the show. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, they're making all this money and all this stuff. And then you have the other side of the of the pendulum and people are um, just so this is their faith like this is their religion almost where healing and miracles is the religion it's not jesus it's yeah. the healing and the re and and the miracles and it is a uh it it's just it's it's the other side of the pendulum and i, I obviously the, there, there's this reality in a fallen world of things we don't understand where we see miracles happen and we are we are commanded to pray for them we're and, and we're told to pray yeah. for them uh and, and and there's also a a reality that everybody's gonna die uh you know and in i always think in the new testament i've just uh i've i always it makes me sound smarter than i am so i want to say i got this on wikipedia this is not like <laughs> i have a i do not have a phd in this uh but i've I, when i preach on suffering and um things like that i mentioned the average lifespan in the first century Roman Empire was uh, 25 years. That's right. That was the average <laughs> lifespan, and uh, that number is is pulled down by the infant mortality rate. So, a huge right. percentage of kids didn't live past like 10, and if you made it past 10, you could you could live into your 50s or 60s. But the point is, there was lots of death all around. There was lots of disease all around. There was not this yeah. under this. Like, what we have today is almost this this thought that like. God isn't real if, you know, my loved one right. dies. It's like we are all going yeah. to die. You know, there's no we can't just perpetually be healed of everything that ever happens to us. Uh, anyway, so there's just to me, that's the nuance you talked about before, like with right. theology on the raw. There's a there's a nuance to this. So I want to read. Um, I'm just going to read the text. James 5, uh, 13 through uh, let's go to 17 or so. And. This is um, one, one of where it, and Chase and I talk about this in, in episode 72 and 82. I just want to get your take on it. Um, and again, I, I'm not asking you for a slam dunk. Um, here's, here's, you know, the, um, the correct way to understand this. But just how have you understood this passage and, and sort of, the, you know, this concept of the, maybe the theology of healing and things like that. So, so let me jump into the text here. James 5.13 it says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I'll stop there at 16. Though 17 and 18 are interesting because it says Elijah, well, I'll just read it. Elijah was a human even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. And again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. So that's the, uh, that's the comparison that James gives um, to, our, to our prayers. So let me toss it back to you. That's, I'm, I know that's a text that you've read and you've studied and, and had to figure out, you know, um, for, for your life. And um, what would you give to listeners as a, uh, maybe some guidelines on how to, how to apply this verse to our personal context and to our church context? 
Yeah, and, and this really gets into the broader topic of scriptures about healing in, in the scriptures. Um, this one just happens to have a super practical outpouring yeah, of it. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, here's how you do do the healing thing. Um, so first of all, I, I'm a Bible guy and I, I'm not a strict literalist, but I take the Bible seriously, you know. Um, I have a high view of the text. So I first thing I want to do is take it surface value. So I think that there are times that if a sick person is in your midst, it is appropriate to have the elders of the, to do what the text says. Yeah. Have the elders of the church take oil, pray over them, and not try and theologically figure out, well, maybe this will or maybe this won't, but like actually ask God with as much faith as you can, mm-hmm. will you heal this person? Okay. Now, if you were under a narrative or a... a uh, a way of viewing the scriptures or viewing God that uh, that said God always heals every time, which f- the theological term for this would be maybe overrealized eschatology, where you're you're like we we are in a period of human history and the history of the story of God where God is always doing the thing; He is always healing. If you had that narrative. And you had someone, the elders come and pray over you and it didn't occur, you could become very jaded. Yeah. And you you could have your faith really torn to bits because your faith and the the story you've been told is if God is real and he's good, this is what's going to happen. It's almost like this equation. However, if you have a perspective of suffering that I think the scriptures are always talking about. And if you have a perspective of where are we at in human history and in the story of God that says, okay, suffering is real, healing occurs, but maybe not all the time, then you can go into that situation and it can be a little bit more safe. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'll say safe for your faith because you can recognize that there are times that God does heal, but there's also times that he doesn't. And it, if if God is good and he's wise and he doesn't heal me, he actually may have a good reason for it. He may have a good outcome that he's he's driving us towards. Um, and so this was the the process that I that I had to go through. So to to kind of flesh this out a bit more, you know, when, when I was maybe 19, 20. I was in this space of God always wants wants people healed if they're if they're sick. Then I found myself in a community that was super super theologically rich and just had a different perspective. And it was like pulling teeth, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Lord did it so gently. And basically, man, he, here's the theological journey that that I went through. Um, you know, in the spaces that preach always healing um they basically believe that the kingdom of god and the uh the power of god all of these things that um the bible does talk about for the future they believe that all of that is fully present now so when you when you read any scripture about the glory of of after jesus returns or the glory of what god plans for us when new creation occurs you know we, we have this hope in, in in the christian faith of of new creation of the glory of of god restoring the heavens and the earth because sin has marred things but god's going to restore the heavens and the earth any any passage that you read about the glory of new creation they would bring that entirely into the present okay and so it's it's over realized eschatology is the the theo- so eschatology being uh uh, you know, the the study of last things. Realized eschatology is things that are talked about in the future occurring a little bit now. An over-realized eschatology is everything that God talks about in the future is already happening after the cross mm-hmm. now. We can, mm-hmm. we can claim it, we can have it now. Um, and what I had to basically go through the process of is realizing actually there is a distinction between the present right now and what God promises for the future. 
Paul talks about the, the time period that we're in right now, he calls it the present evil age. And, and what that means is that we're in a time period where the world is still broken. Mm-hmm. It's still under sin. There's still a, a curse on creation. The maybe curse isn't the best term, but there's still brokenness in the cosmos. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't intervene. God does intervene. Read the Bible. Look, look at, I mean, come on, people. Like, <laughs> come on, cessationists. Like, <laughs> look at look at your life. There are miracles happening every day. I mean, stories from, you know, the Middle East or South America, stories from America today, miracles are occurring. But there is this, there's this nuanced, um, I think, perspective that the scriptures would give us that though God does intervene, we are still in a period where there is brokenness and there is pain. And look, that's very difficult. Mm. That's very tough because there's pain in this world and that people go through that is catastrophic. I mean, like, let's be real. I went through something that was catastrophic and you could be like, God, why in the world would you not intervene in this? Like fix it, God. There's pain that's catastrophic and that's just part of this world. And that's, that is where we're at in the period of time that of the story of God, of the unfolding story of God, that's where we're at, but God does intervene. And I think if we can have a perspective of both, where it's not all one yep. or all the other, we're, we're going to be able to navigate this better. And we can pray for healing, but not get jaded when it doesn't happen. Mm. Um, and, and we have to have a lot of faith here, because if it doesn't happen, we could get very angry with God. But again, if we believe that God is all good and he's all wise, then I have to be able to trust, okay, if he doesn't do it, he has a good reason. Um, and the last piece of this, I know I'm going long, but the last piece of this that I had to go through is to actually gain a deep longing and rejoicing hope for this promise of new creation. Yeah. So, you know, my formative years, I was able-bodied and then my body was disabled. And that's, that's a very, very difficult thing to go through, especially at 18. Um, so it could be depressing. It could be very painful. Thankfully, the Lord, his spirit, he kept me from the depression side of things, but it was still very hard, you know? Yeah. And so I had to go through one more, one more element of the theological shift where I actually had to get excited about and joyful about the fact that when Jesus returns, mm and new creation happens, I will have a restored body. Yeah. You know, and that the suffering now actually gains me a reward in the future. Mm. As I, as I suffer faithfully, God actually rewards this in the age to come, you know? So we're in this present evil age, but then there's the age to come, which is glory, which is new creation. It's garden of Eden take two, you know? So we can't just kind of get jazzed up about that in our own, in our own flesh. We actually have to have the spirit of God do the work in us to actually make us excited about those realities, Mm. but they're all through the scriptures. And I think, I think we haven't been discipled in a proper perspective of suffering and a proper perspective of new creation. New creation has been ethereal and go off to heaven no, no, no. New creation is Jesus coming back to restore the earth and to give us resurrected bodies. That's the anchor that I had to, before the anchor was healing now, now the anchor is full healing at the re- return of Jesus. Mm. So now you're preaching, Cameron. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, yeah. Bro. Amen to that. Um, that was great. Well, let me shift gears a little from the from the theological into the personal. Uh, you, you you hinted at some of this in your talk back in March, so I feel comfortable going there. You know, you talked about 
losing friends, you know, from, yeah. from when your injury happened. And I was kind of surprised by that. You know, you kind of think your friends would rally to you. And um, wh- why why do you think you lost friends? And if if you're able to kind of walk us through, if you're comfortable talking about that, how, how did that process happen? And 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 why did that happen? And then I think there's some there's some practical takeaways we can we can take away from that too. Yeah, sure, man. So first of all, I again I try to be as gracious as I can. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to assume motivations. And I still, man, I deeply love the people that were in my life at that time. Part of it, man, was I was 18 and we were in transitions of life. And, you know, after an injury, like I went through a lot of your life kind of pauses, you know, you have to kind of stop to just (laughs) learn to live life again. Um, And some of the other people, they they can't just pause, you know, or, or maybe they could, but it, it, it would be unfair for, for me just to pause their life. So there was some of that, but that wasn't, that wasn't everything. You know, there was also, um, friends that the, we were really close and then pretty quickly we weren't, and it was almost awkwardly. So, um, so I honestly, some of the friends that I had at that time were also in the faith healing thing and community. Sure. Some of the mentors I had at that time were also in the faith healing. And it almost seemed like, you know, give it a year, give it a year and a half. Things aren't happening. It it really almost seemed like, oh, are you leaving because I'm not getting the healing? And man, I just, I don't want to assume that, but it, at that time, it sure seemed like it, you know, it sure seemed like that was, that was part of the the dynamic. Um, You know, there was also this one, I really don't talk about much. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you listeners an exclusive. Um, There was also kind of the romantic side of things where I had someone that I was like really close with and um, we weren't, we were both influenced by I kissed dating goodbye, which is a <laughs> sure, whole other sure. thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and so we weren't dating, but you know, we told each other we loved each other. We were planning to potentially get married at one point, and very quickly after after my injury, um, you know, that relationship ended. And there were there were other dynamics that could have been the reason, but was my injury kind of like. Did it help the process of the breakup happen? Yeah. Again, it sure seemed like it at the time. Um, but I, you know, I would never want to, I would never want to say that was the reason that there, there were probably other dynamics too, but yeah, there was just the relational side of things are, it's very difficult after, after a spinal cord injury or after, after becoming disabled, um, you know, what if you can't keep up with your friends anymore? You know, they have to slow their pace down if they're around you. Mm-hmm. You know, some people, they, it's, it's hard for them to have a friend that they have to do that for. Um, anyway. Yeah. What's cool though, man, is that now I have new friends who have gotten to know me, Who you know, they didn't know me before, but they've gotten to know me purely in the context of me as a disabled person. And so they didn't have to relearn anything, which, you know, they, maybe they would have been fine relearning it too, but they've gotten to know me as I am now. And they, what's cool is that the new friends that you get after a dis after a disability, they're the friends that are cool with being with you as a disabled person, you know? So it's almost like a more substantial form of friendship. If, if that makes sense, you know, and they, love and appreciate me for who I am as a disabled person and for the things that I bring to the relationship and to the friendship because man, and this is a whole nother topic, but I I think when you can change your mindset from disability being an issue of a medical malady to an issue of diversity, Mm. then you can recognize that, Oh, well, this person actually brings something to the relationship or to the community that we were lacking before, yeah, you know? And so when you can have friendships or relationships 
that will recognize that and recognize that what you been the benefit that you bring to their life, then they can actually see you for the, you know, the, the beautiful thing that you are as a disabled person, you know, because I bring perspectives and I bring um, experiences to a relationship or to a community as a disabled person that an able body doesn't, you know, and yeah. vice versa, you know, that that's diversity. One isn't superior to the other, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's super helpful. I, I think uh, I was reflecting on this question as I was preparing for the interview and I say this uh, sort of in confession, sort of in try to be really candid, you know, because I, I think yeah, totally. I've, I've been in this boat and I, I think that um, I think often able-bodied people, because we have such little experience with disabled people, um, I would I would I, I think um, I'm going to say we because I don't want to indict myself too much because it just feels too <laughs> uh, it just feels too like, you know, icky, but. I don't think we often always see disabled people as normal um, socially. And so, so I would, I would bet you've experienced two types of things uh, socially. And, and I, I'm thinking about like socially as well as you will, you, you like enter a church, right? You, you, you come into a church, maybe you're visiting or, or whatever. Um, there's a standoffishness that certain able body people have because there's just a mystery. There's an uncertainty. Maybe there's a, I don't, do they want me to go talk to them? You know, kind of thing. So, so I'm going to just stay away. I don't want to stare. I don't want to stare, you know? And so I'm just going to like look over here instead. I'm going to look at the yeah. ceiling. Right. And then you have the other extreme where you could, I could see you becoming like the exotic token, you know, you're the um, kind of the exotic one. That's, that's, uh, you know, kind of, fascinating you know in, in that sort of sense but still not treated as 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 normal and i think ron sanderson in our interview you know he talked about he's talking about people with autism but just disabled people in general and he's like we just want friends like anybody else you know yeah, like, totally. we um and for whatever reason like that gets easily lost i on able-bodied people like i i don't know the brain science behind that but it why would you being in a wheelchair versus standing up like have any indicator of like your desire for friendship or community or your you know all, all those sorts of things and so um i i i wanted to shift kind of this question towards because uh, it applies to friendship um but but often for like an able-bodied christian um where are you going to where are you going to make friends with someone with a disability? I mean, maybe you have some ideas for right. that uh, and share them. If you do, I'm thinking if somebody enters your church, though, somebody's looking for a church and they enter your church, if you're visiting a church, what is it that you, you hope to experience there as far as how you're treated and how you're, how you're interacted with uh, really, I guess when somebody first meets you um, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of tie this into a church question too, so that we can start to make our churches places where people in disabilities just feel loved and welcomed and not that they're this exotic token, but not where they're just ignored and dismissed either. Yeah, such good questions, man. So I'll start it this way. Um, the word access is used a lot within disability spaces. And when we think about access, a lot of times we think of like the physical barriers that are removed so that a disabled person can come in. But actually access can also refer to uh, social stigmas that are removed in order for us to access even friendships or access relationships or access uh, positions of influence or leadership within a church. So, you know, the first most basic form of access is the access of, do you have uh, the ramp or the lack of barrier needed for me to even get into the space, right? So space communicates a lot. Physical, uh, physical space communicates our ideals. It communicates what we assume to be normal. So is the space such that it communicates to me that I am on equal playing field with everyone here, mm -hmm. that no one here is superior. You know, there's not one normal 
the normal is a broader is is a broader term in this in this church. So that's the first thing. Um, space communicates a lot. Uh, the next thing, man, I, you know, this is going to be different for a lot of people because, again, when you're dealing with intellectual disabilities versus physical disabilities, you know, we're dealing with two different things. You know, disability yep. is, a, is a broad term, but really, I think the gold standard should be um, disability-specific conversations or research. Um, but so physical disabilities is more what I can speak to better. But I, I certainly, <laughs> I have certainly had the the situation where people are just awkward. And, and, I, and I think it's because, again, I was able-bodied for, actually, most of my life I've been able-bodied. Um, that number is, is <laughs> the, it's going right. to tip pretty soon. But right, right, a few more years. Still, still most of my life I was, I was able-bodied. And you, you don't know, like, when you first see a person in, in a wheelchair, you're like, are they different? Do they know how to have a conversation or like, where do I stand or should I sit down or are they awkward? There's a, a hundred different things that could go through an able-bodied person's mind of like, I just don't know. Like there is something different. Yeah. What's the brain science? Like, yeah, there is yeah. something different. How do I interact with it? We should get a psychologist on and they can explain <laughs> yeah. it. What I try to do, and again, this is me kind of accommodating maybe to my able-bodied friends, but what I try to do is I try to just be normal after the first interaction or <laughs> this is terrible. I, I uh, you know, I try to like show that I might actually be intellectually superior than the person. And then they're <laughs> like, and I may not be, but you know, uh, and it's just kind of like what that does is this tears down the uh, the stigmas or the assumptions or the confusions. And it shows that person through the interaction that, again, I hate that I have to like cater to the person, but I, I'm trying to be gracious. Um, it shows in the interaction, I am actually equally as, as much a human as you are. And we can interact like both of us are, are you know, quote, normal human beings I just have a different way of getting around than you do, you know, and what that, what that can show the person is, Oh, we're, we're, we're both, we're both people here, you know, and, and hopefully from there, the interaction can change. What, what, what that presumes though, is that we have enough time to actually interact and humanize each other. Yeah. The problem happens is, and this has happened to me this one time it happened. It was so weird. Um, where there isn't enough time, the the person comes in and begins talking to me or at me as though I am a child or this like person unable to to do anything for myself. And, and the problem is, is like often dis disabilities get like glorified as like the the righteous sufferer so the person that i was just chuckling about i was at a it was a assemblies of god so it was kind of a more charismatic church though you wouldn't necessarily know it um and this older gentleman i'm sure he's a sweet man and i'm sure he has a, a, a golden heart and does plenty of charity but he came up to me and, and I like had to, I like turned and he was just like turned into my, in my view. And as soon as we saw each other, he's like, oh, you poor soul, you're just so faithful. And I couldn't imagine. And you're just, you're so strong and faithful and all the, all the things. Yeah. Yeah. And I usually don't get taken aback by things, but I was just like, oh, and, and I didn't try to like preach to him or teach him about disability in the church. I just said, thank you, sir. Because I, I knew there's, you know, there's 60 years of background leading up to him, assuming, making the assumptions that he did in that interaction. 
And again, I want to be gracious in that moment. Um, but if we can humanize each other, if we can be around diverse populations enough to realize, well, gosh, they're just people like I am. They just get around differently. And maybe they can't go hiking up in the mountains, though, with the right chair, I could. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if we humanize each other enough, then we can recognize, OK, we're all we're all people here. And what that does is it tears down the barriers of access that are social, right? Yeah. So once I've had that humanizing interaction, then the barrier of access that keeps me from being able to treat you like a normal human, um, that can be torn down and we can proceed forward in, in the relationships. Yeah. So long answer. But... No, that's great. That's super helpful. Let me get you out of here on this. Uh, just tell us about okay. your ministry, Cameron Horner Ministries. Uh, tell us kind of about your heart for for what you're doing on the ministry side. And also practically if people want, can book you for speaking, I think, and just anything else like that and, and where people can, can get a hold of you to be able to do that sort of thing. Yeah, totally. So Cameron Horner ministry started short up shortly after my injury, um, just as a way to find speaking and preaching and stuff. Um, so my heart is what we've been doing here is to kind of inform the church about disabilities um, one, to tear down the, the stigmas, but the barrier to access. That's what we've been talking about. So, um, you know, I, I, I want to inform churches of uh, how the, we can do this better, um, inform churches and or, or organizations broadly of, like, here, here's how you can serve and love your, your disabled uh, congregants or friends better. Or to answer the question, why don't we have disabled people in our church? 25% of the, of the population in America is disabled. Are 25% of your congregation disabled? Mm. If not, why? What's what's the barrier to access? So I, I'm just, I, I, wanna, I wanna help the body of Christ, you know, with that. Yeah. Um, but also there's another side of, I think that our perspective on suffering is, has been off. Um, so I, I, I want to use my story to help us rightly understand, okay, how do we think about suffering? How do we think about brokenness in the world? And a lot of times suffering and disability get inappropriately mixed together. Um, so there's that side, but there is a side of my journey that has to do with suffering and I've had, I've had to think about it. So yeah, that's, that's my heart. Um, as far as booking me to speak, Cameron Horner Ministries is kind of the tag for everything. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and then I have a website. I don't do a ton of social media, so don't try and find me on a ton of stuff there. It, it, it's out there, but I don't do a ton. But my website is, is a great place. You yep. can go there and um, pretty easily find some of my story, some stuff about me and how to book me. Um, yeah, that. great. So I keep yeah. up on your your rugby career on your, your oh, Instagram, right. <laughs> I think. So that's yeah, a, good, yeah. a good spot, which is awesome. Yeah. So wheelchair rugby is a yeah. thing. And, it's and then great. you get injured. You get injured playing wheelchair rugby. Which yeah, can, the I love traumatic it. brain injury I had a couple months ago. Yeah. I still have the scar right here. I don't know if you can see it on the camera for those on YouTube, nice. but yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was great. I love it. Well, well, hey, keep it up. Honestly, I love seeing the rugby. I think well, it's a whole other part of the interview we don't have time to get to, but I just, sure. I love that. I, you know, I'm a sports guy myself and I love that you're out there and uh, just, I'm sure, you know, people are like, why are you doing that? You're, you know, you're already in a wheelchair. It's like, man, you're living life. Oh, bro. I, yeah. I love it. It's Golly. so great. Competing. I slam and into somebody. Get, getting slammed and slamming yeah. into people <laughs> and getting injured, man. I love it. That's so great. Yeah. So, uh, Cameron, I just want to say, honestly, keep up the great work with your ministry. It's really helpful, I think. And I think Exiles in Babylon showed this. This is an area that the church is really underdeveloped in. Yes. I think that was the most, for me and my friends I was with, that part of the conference was the best part of the conference because mm -hmm. it was it was something we'd never really considered. And, and as you consider it, you go, wow. This is really important. This is this is really significant. So uh, keep it up. You're you're doing great work, and I just want to bless you Thanks, in bro. that. Yeah, and I want to thank you, man, for coming on to the flip side. And uh, just thanks for having me. I love yeah, this. This absolutely. was so much fun. Yeah, man. We hope to be your third favorite podcast. So that's our goal. <laughs> you so. may be already, actually. I think I've told you that. <laughs> nice. All right, Cam. Thanks so much, man. Yeah. Thank you.
All right. Welcome back. I hope that that conversation uh, helped you. I hope it helps you in your faith, in your theology. I hope it's inspirational to you. I also hope there are some practical takeaways for you at your church, if you're a church leader, to start thinking differently about how even how your church is set up. Uh, if you're a, a church goer and attender, giving you eyes to see uh, people with disabilities and how we can how we can best provide uh, access. And I love the social access piece that Cameron uh, talked about. Uh, reach out to Cameron if you want to connect more. If you want to have him uh, come speak at your church, Cameron Horner Ministries. Dot org. Also, a reminder that on the uh, flip side, we mentioned this at the beginning, but you can check out episodes uh, 72, 73, and 82 if you want to jump into more conversations about the theology of, of healing and, and sort of the different perspectives on that, as well as uh, disability in the church with uh, episode 73. Thanks again for listening. I really do appreciate it. We're going to have at least one, uh, maybe two Noah's Rants coming your way soon for Noah's Rants fans. They are coming. Be sure to subscribe uh, on the the audio podcast to catch up on all the five-minute flips. Check out YouTube as well. And uh, if you want to support the podcast, you can do that at podbean.com slash Noah Philippiak. Uh, And a great way you can support is to share your favorite episode. Maybe it was this one. And uh, share it on social media. Ask, uh, let your friends know why you listen and encourage them to give it a listen. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it and love, uh, I, love the, I love what God's doing. I, lo- I love uh, being able to do this and connect with you in this way. And I'm just really appreciative. So until next time, I will see you on the flip side. The Flip Side with Noah Philippia is a Beyond Ministries production. Copyright Noah Philippia. www.noahphilippiac.com. Theme music by Kyle Lake at K Lake Music. Used with permission. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever podcasts are found. It's time to bring me closer. There's no purgatory because you're in or you're out. When you see them in the clouds, you know it's going down. Raise them, raise them, raise them. They've been sleeping for some ages. Now all God's babies so confused by this hatred. Poor pit preachers shouldn't aim to be A-list. Money probably long, but short as